Hello and welcome to this video. Today we are talking about worksheets and how we can ditch them. So we're going to be sharing with you lots of practical examples and ideas for how you can reduce your reliance on worksheets, get rid of some of those worksheets and try something else. And I know especially uh, during online learning, remote learning, distance learning, um, being able to get away from those packets and engage students with some digital activities can be a really, really good thing. So we're so thankful that you're watching this video and that you're joining us and we are happy to be here with you. So my name is Matt Miller. I'm from Ditch That Textbook and I am right here alongside Holly Clark. San Diego, California. I see we have people from all over. I'm excited for you to put them on the screen. I know. Yeah, me too. So uh, Holly's from San Diego. I'm from rural Indiana out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so if you're watching this um, on the video and not live, then welcome and thank you for watching the video. You are going to get the benefit of lots of ideas from both Holly and myself, but also from all the people that are here live. And if you are here live and you're watching this video, I think we are in for some fun because we're going to be pulling from some of your ideas is pulling from some of my ideas and Holly's ideas, and we're going to just brainstorm a whole bunch of ways that we can get away from those traditional worksheets. So we're going to do a quick check-in with some of the folks that are here. So I'm going to do these rapid fire. Here we go. We got Krista from Michigan. Hello. Morning. We got Emmanuel from Portland, Oregon. Karen's here from Alberta. Morning. And then we've got Julie from North Carolina. Steven's here from California. California. Yep. Hello, Californian, right? Um, Mary Ann is here. Michelle from South Dakota, welcome. Dave is here from Washington. Bill is here from Michigan, middle school technology education teacher. Awesome, very good. Brittany is here from North Carolina. Ron is here from Pennsylvania. That's a familiar name to me on my Twitter feed. I see Ron on a pretty regular basis. Linda's here from New Jersey, welcome. And Vicki from North Carolina. Natasha's here. We've got Jen Conti is here. There's another familiar name. Yeah. Barbara, a Spanish living in Portugal and a teacher of English and Spanish as foreign languages. Awesome. Ooh, Very good. We're outside the United States. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kristen's here from jo Jonesboro, Arkansas. We've got Tara from British Columbia. We've got, oh goodness, wow. there's a bunch of you there's folks here. There's so and I, many. I know. I don't think that I can get to all of you. So we're going to shout out the ones that we can. And as we continue on through this video, please do continue to uh, drop comments into the chat because we're going to be referring to those as we present and as we talk to you. So I'm trying to throw as many of these onto the screen as possible. So with that in mind, Holly, we're going to be talking about worksheets or more specifically how we can ditch those worksheets, right? We are. And I'm super excited to get started. I'm going to put the slides up. And when you're ready, you can um, put those on the, the uh, other part. On the video again. Oh, <laughs> I feel there glad that they're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so last um, week, on uh, Tuesday, we had quite a few Millers involved um, in yeah. the audience. And that was pretty fun for me since I don't really get to meet them in person. And lots and lots of people coming to this. And I think the reason is, is because this is such a dynamic um uh, topic. So if you hear something that you like, we'd love to start using ditch that worksheet. Like if you're doing something that allows us to rethink that, go ahead and share it on Twitter, Instagram. Let's make a new, um, let's make a new hashtag. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can make learning more dynamic and meaningful by thinking beyond the worksheet. And your takeaway are going to be 20 ideas from an infographic that we made and also examples that we're bringing in that I've curated, some from my own classroom or my co-teaching classroom, some from friends that I have, and some just from the darn internet because they were so good. That's so great. Matt, I love this quote. So something to like take a breath and read because I love what it says. It says if they could do the worksheet, they don't need it. And if they can't, it won't help them anyway. And I'm just adding the anyway. So something we need to think about, I think as a teacher, and you can comment on this too in a second, Matt, but as a teacher, I got given um, a book 
and it had questions at the end. And I was a history teacher in my very first year, history and English. And um, I had a bunch of worksheet uh, books that I could make copies from. And sometimes I felt like if I weren't doing that, some of the other teachers were giving me the evil eye, like I needed to be at the copy mm -hmm. machine. How about you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is that is very much the truth. I know for me in my high school Spanish classes, we did lots of repetition through, um, you know, conversation and practicing like that. And so I just didn't end up in the copier room all that much. And so we've got these kids that are, you know, doing these worksheets, doing this homework for all these other teachers. And that is, that is a real thing. You know, that whole, mm -hmm. am I doing enough? Am I, and sometimes you feel like you're doing enough, but there's the perception that you're not yeah. doing enough. Um, and, and I mean, that's a, that's a real thing, especially whenever we're evaluated by, you know, our administrators and everything. And so those are, those are real concerns, but I think the big question we have to come back to not is not, am I giving them enough stuff to put grades in the book and look, make it look like there's a lot of activity going on. The big question has got to be, are the kids learning and is what we're doing helping them to learn in the way they need to? So, and I want to put a caveat out there that um, I read about five years ago, an article by Kristen Wydeen, who writes um, a, an iPad book, and I found it to be true ever since I read it. And she said she would, she was doing all of these visible thinking activities with iPads and kids were creating and they were doing all this stuff. And she was like, I'm such a great teacher. And then one day a kid came to her and said, Miss Wydeen, can we please go back to worksheets? Mm -hmm. And she was like, but, but this is so great. And, uh, and she sat down and reflected on it and kind of talked to the kids about that comment. And they said, they're easier. I don't have to think. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to do anything. And I had that exact same scenario right before, like two days before we went into quarantine from a kid in Oklahoma who was like, can we just do a worksheet? Right. And it was because I was making them tell me what they had learned. And they don't mm -hmm. want to go through that struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that's that's a shift. You know, that's that's like a sort of like a culture, like um, what are you building in your classroom, whether it's physically in a classroom or if it's digitally, like is the culture, I'm going to do, I'm going to check the things off and get the grade and get the points, or is it I'm going to actually demonstrate my thinking. And whenever you make that shift, it's not going to be easy at first. It's like, you know, I talk sometimes about how progress is like pushing a boulder. You know, imagine there's like this great big boulder sitting here and you push on that boulder and you push it as hard as you can and it's not going anywhere. And you start to think, my goodness, is this boulder going to like go anywhere? Is this going to do anything? Am I wasting my time? And if you apply enough force for long enough, it just barely budges just a little bit. And then once it budges, if you keep applying that force, it budges a little more and a little more until eventually it starts to roll. But at first you start to think it's never going to go anywhere. And I think whenever we make that shift from, are we just going to do stuff to collect points to, are we going to actually think? And thinking is hard. You know, that's a big shift that's going to feel like pushing that boulder, I think. Yeah. And another really quick um analogy I was reading on Facebook just yesterday that one of my friends, Susan Stewart, she was like, I just went into one of the educational apps websites and everyone was asking, how do you take a teacher pay teacher worksheet and put it on the app and annotate it? And she's like, I got to stay out of these places because mm -hmm. it hurt me to think you're going to take this incredible app. And then you're going to say, Oh, can I mix it up with teachers pay teachers? And listen, there's some good stuff on teachers pay teachers. It's rare, I'm going to say, but, um, but like Jen Gonzalez has some good stuff on there, but how do we uh, not take the worksheet and how do we get at better thinking and learning? And that's what we're going to talk about. So we can mm -hmm. probably just jump right in. Let me head back. So, over yeah. And, yeah. This is um, by the way, I thought this was such a, a mic drop comment right here. Julie says the shift needs to be a culture shift, not just a classroom shift. If not, then the students struggle a great deal. I thought that was really well said. It's such a great thing. And also, as we um, we need to remember in our heads, um, no parent ever said, man, I wish there were more worksheets up in my house. Right. I wish kids would have more. So the culture shift's already happening at home. It's just a matter of maybe administrators, I don't know, maybe your team, whatever. So I want to show this as an example, this video, and I hope it plays out. We haven't tried doing video, I don't think. Maybe we have. And um, 
And it's an example, and this is an old video that went around the Twitters five years ago, but, but it kind of gives us an idea about what math really is when we put it into a worksheet. So here's a kid doing their typical algebra homework after soccer practice. They grab their iPhone or smartphone, they scan the question, and there's the answer. And that's what can happen now on smartphones, but it gets better than that. If you press the arrow button at the bottom of that smartphone, we get the steps. So it shows us how much we need to really rethink yeah. what we're asking kids to do. Now, if we had had them go on to Seesaw and do that problem or four of those problems and show themselves doing the work, not just showing the work, <laughs> which is what my teachers used to do. And I'll be honest, I found a way, to, we didn't have smartphones, but I, there was answers at the back of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, if we ask kids to explain and articulate over that thought process, that's what we need uh, to be able to do. So um, we're gonna actually skip past this, what's the goal of the worksheet and take you to uh, exactly what we were promising you today, an infographic of things that you can do in your classroom. And we'd love for you to share. If you're doing stuff like this, ditch those worksheets or ditch that worksheet um, on Twitter, put it in the chat right now and let us share out what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be dropping lots of those into the video as we go through because Holly and I have several examples. And as you can see on the screen right here, let's go ahead and full screen that. <laughs> Didn't make it that much bigger, but um, we've put together this <laughs> infographic, one of those tall Pinterest style infographics called 20 Ways to Ditch Those Worksheets. And as you can kind of see in the magnification that we've got all of these 20 different ideas and little uh, icons to highlight them. And so what Holly have done and I have done is we've posted this infographic on our online learning ideas website. So onlinelearningideas.com slash big dash ideas. That's where it is right now as of the recording of this uh, video. And so if you wanna go check out the whole thing, it's all right there. But what we did in this video is we pulled out a couple of specific examples out of this um, infographic. And so I've pulled three and Holly's pulled three. We're gonna just kind of work through some actual examples that we can show you on the screen. We'll see how many of them we get to, and we're going to try to, um, you know, actually put a face to some of these ideas and show you what they might actually look like. And of course, if you're sharing stuff in the comments, we would love to put those onto the screen as well. And if you've got links to the things that you're talking about, that's even better. And then that way, everybody can click through and see exactly what you're talking about. Okay, let's get started with some of these ideas, and we'll start with you, Matt. Yes, I would love oh, to start. With this. Yeah, that's okay. Um, too much, many things. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is an idea that this is where if you're taking something like a story or a novel or something from history and you want to have students kind of like, for lack of a better term, you want to have them play with it. You know, like we're not just re repeating facts back, but we're like taking what we've learned and actually doing something with it. I love this idea of this activity called Caption This. Um, this is something that I worked through with an English teacher, English and Spanish teacher in Missouri named Laura Steinbrink. She and I worked through this and actually wrote a blog post. And if you go to the link on the screen, ditch that textbook.com slash caption this, um, you can see this all spelled out a little bit more specifically. But basically the idea behind this is you take a slide um, from a slide presentation tool, you know, your PowerPoint or your Google slides, you just take one slide and stick a picture on it. And then within that picture, there's a lot of annotation that you can do. So like level one is just label the things in the picture. That's easy to do. You can do that with text boxes or shapes. Um, sometimes the shapes can be like little speech bubbles too, or thought bubbles, which is what leads you to the upper levels of this which basically is saying if this character or this person could say something in this instance, what would they say? Or what do you think they were thinking in this instance? So this gets us beyond recall four facts about this event, recall four facts about this act yeah. in the play. Now we're starting to get inside the shoes, inside the brain of the character. 
and say what we think they're saying or what we think they're thinking is whenever we're able to do that, we're taking the perspective of a character. And whenever we put ourselves in their shoes and try to think like them, first of all, we can't do that if we don't have a whole lot of information, if we haven't learned something about them. So this is just another way to show what we've learned, but also to take it to a little bit higher level by taking it to somebody else's perspective. And again, this is something that you can very simply do just with a slide presentation tool like PowerPoint or Google Slides. Just use one slide. It's kind of like a big sheet of paper. Put an image on top of it. Could be a historical painting. It could be a photo. It could be an artist's rendering of the story. And then add speech bubbles and thought bubbles to it. And there are other levels that you can take this to where you justify your thinking and everything. We've got several of those examples in this post. So you can check that out at ditchthattextbook.com slash caption this. And that's a great example. And I didn't mean to be looking off to the side. I'm doing another one uh, for the next example that a Fine. teacher yeah. I curated and I wanted to be able to tell her thoughts. But there were some really good things going on while you were talking and people were bringing up the idea that hyperdocs are a really great thing. Someone warned that a link with docs is not a hyperdoc. And so maybe we should have a, a big ideas around hyperdocs coming yeah, up. Yeah, that's right. And this is true. Someone talked about doing a novel hyperdoc, which Matt has has a great post on that right now mm -hmm. written by Carly um, mm -hmm. and Mora and uh, hyperdocs make a great way to put a student facing lesson forward. So a uh, really great idea. Someone was talking about Wakelet, someone. So all of these, we'd love to have you share out on Twitter too, because we need to get momentum around ditching that uh, those worksheets. Mm -hmm. So the next example is, um, and you're going to see me make sure to give this teacher the um, ideas out there that she wants, but this is an example from a social studies teacher, and she doesn't want to be named because her, her school is kind of a little bit crazy, but man, is she great. And she was having kids put together um, newspapers around the industrial age. And she wanted me to point out that um, this wasn't just a, or the industrial revolution, but it was also about media literacy and allowing the kids to explore politics and bias. And this was actually done in a high school history class. I do believe it's an AP class, by the way. I can't be I'm sure about that. And one of the pieces was on Karl Marx Communist Manifesto. So some kids focus on the exploration of workers, while others, uh, other more conservative students focus on capitalism, um, or they took an alternative view and imagined how a newspaper might be biased toward, oh, this is good stuff, right? Toward mm -hmm. that particular view and how that would influence writing, marketing, etc. And so this was wasn't just an, um, them putting in the industrial revolution in the cute little like gossip area that you see there. And this was, um, this was looking at literacy, critical thinking, narrative and bias, all of these great things instead of kids doing a worksheet around the industrial revolution. And this was done in something called Adobe Page. You could also use a Microsoft Sway. Um, if you're not, if your school does not allow for Adobe, which I hope it does, but if it doesn't, you could use um, Google Sites. So the the tool is not important. It's the critical thinking that's important. Yeah, I love this. And what's so great about this to me is that this isn't about fact recall. This is about taking what you've learned and sort of like purposefully putting it together in a presentation that someone else might see. And I think this, this of course, gets amplified whenever you're able to share it with some sort of an audience, if there's some way to do that so that somebody else can see it. And that is one of the nice things about Adobe Spark page is that you can make a link that is an outward facing link that you can share with other people. So yeah, definitely and really good stuff. You can turn it in in a Padlet where kids could all see each other's because I'm very much into kids seeing each other's ideas and comparing and contrasting and thinking about their thinking in a me metacognitive way about each other's work samples. So, um, yeah, taking it one step further to the press record, I like to say, is important. So mm -hmm. I'm, I have another example for social studies, and this is um, something that I used to do a lot using um, 
this was in slides. Now I would probably send kids to Adobe Post or Canva because I think they're savvy enough for that, especially in the middle school where I taught. But this is just taking something that we learned the middle ages. And I was also taking, teaching um, uh, uh, literature English. So I wanted them to do devices and give me a summary of the middle ages. And you could see they did um, their literary device by frequently frustrating and positively pensive. Um, <laughs> so that was, they had to critically think about that in many ways. Uh, so that's just an example. We'll go to the next one, which is yours. Yeah, so this one's cool. Um, I don't know if uh, you've gotten a chance to play with Sutori before. I say this to Holly and to, to you that are that's watching. Um, this is a this is a pretty cool thing. And so the idea behind this is that if we have something that is time based, you know, if there are events in a chronological sequence. What we could do, of course, is we could say, what was the date that this happened? Or on this date, what happened? You know, we can stick that into a worksheet and it becomes very superficial. But again, what we could do is we could take what we've learned and turn it into something that students create instead of just what they recall. And so what's really, really cool about Sutori is that um, Sutori lets you create these timelines. And these aren't like left to right timelines. These are top to bottom ones so that you can scroll and scroll and scroll as far as you need to. And what you do with Sutori is that, and you can kind of see this in the example. Let me make it just a little bit bigger so it's easier to a little easier to see is that you can add these text boxes and you can add these images and you can add all sorts of stuff. I think you can add clickable links too. And instead of just recalling these facts, you have students add them to the timeline in order. And then you can even notice down in the bottom right, it says check for understanding. So there's even a way that you can have them answer questions to see if they pick things up accurately. Now, if I remember correctly about Sutori, this isn't one of those where you do the check for understanding and you collect the grades and you put them in the grade book. This is more of like, you know, just giving students the opportunity to see, did I learn this? Did this make sense? So it's kind of like they're doing it for themselves instead of doing it for you as a grade. But lots and lots that you can do this with. Um, obviously, this fits very well with literature. It fits well with um, you know social studies and history. This could even work well with science. If you're talking about a number of steps, you could put steps on a timeline for something like a science lab or you know the process of mitosis or you know how you know things that happen with an atom or whatever um, you know animal migrations. I'm just uh, kind of spitballing here, but there's <laughs> there's a lot that you can do with these timelines for sure. Well. Um I haven't played with Satori, and one of my favorite people on the planet, Lisa Heifel, talks about it all the time. So if Lisa Heifel and you like it, I've got to get involved with Satori. Um, so Matt, uh, I want to be able to show another um, Chrome tab in a second. So we're going to have to work through that. But what I'm about to show you, I don't think we've talked about much, and I'm pretty excited because it's a game changer, I think. And it's really fun and kids figure it out really quickly. So let me head over to the next slide. This is called, the right hand side is an example I grabbed from a site called Brush Ninja. And it allows kids to quickly and easily animate stuff. So first we have, or we have an example of a DNA um, worksheet. And this is a kid actually making a DNA, which, or, or, uh, or is it a chromosome? It's a, you know, it's DNA, <laughs> same sort of thing. Chromosomes are in DNA, but anyway, and I want to show you. So I'm going to, um, I have to actually head back over to StreamYard and reshare so that I can get to another, um, Chrome thing. Let me see what happens here. Let me just go to it really quick. And oh. and if you want to play, can you see it? We can still see the slide that okay, you have. Okay, perfect. Had That's what I thought. That's what I yeah. thought. Okay, so if you want to play along, you just go to brush.ninja. And I'm going to head back over to StreamYard and just choose really quickly a different Chrome uh, tab. Mm -hmm. And let's just take a look so i'm not going to be able to do anything i don't even know what i was doing with this one uh, <laughs> that you're that you see Beautiful, but if I, <laughs> I think i was going to try and make something and then i forgot but if i go to the next one oh you can see so i made something we were playing the other day and i guess it kept it but on the bottom 
each of these slides that I make. So I just draw on each of these slides and then I press play and it turns into that animation. So kids are having a lot of fun with that. And I'm gonna come back over and go back to my other tab. Um, and which you see this math example, which like makes me so excited for math. Um, let me head back really quick to Chrome and here we go. This and, up real quick as you're switching yeah. over, by the way, Julie just said, what about showing a process using Sutori going back to the timelines? I think that's fantastic. Like do something like the water cycle, you know, it's got all of these different steps in order. That would be a really good fit with that. So. So I'm freaking out over this one because I feel really strongly about application of knowledge. So these kids are taking their their um, understanding of the Y and X axis and what it does and how it can make things change and putting it into a one of those brush ninjas where each of these is a different drawing. And um, so we know that kids take information with them when they have transfer of knowledge, when they apply what they've learned to a new and novel situation. And this is transfer of knowledge at its best. I think I would be so much better at math in my adult life. I was really good as a kid because I could do all the worksheets and I got them done and I got A's on all of them. But now in my adult life, I don't even remember this stuff because of the way that we were taught. So this one excites me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, has anyone out there use Brush Ninja? Super excited about this one. And if you haven't, go check out Brush Ninja. Yeah, I'm seeing that little stick figure activity there. And I'm thinking if I was a kid, that would be a lot of fun to do. I kind of want to go and do it right now. So <laughs> we'll just wait yeah. till after the after this. So right, oh, right. sorry, w one more for me. And this is an example on Padlet um, of taking a worksheet where kids might do a writing prompt. And instead of doing the writing prompt alone, I um, had kids so I would put up the writing prompt, which is, what would the dog say if he could speak? And then each kid, as they begin to answer, uh, put up their own, um, their own like one sentence. And this for me was a starting activity, um, their own sentence of that. So the first kid puts, thirst is overtaking me. I would totally rehydrate if this uh, huge, ridiculous collar wasn't blocking me from bending down to gulp a much needed <laughs> sip of water. And so every kid after that's like, oh, is that where we're going? Like there, and, and I would see them use gulp a lot again and take words from each other and use those in theirs that they would put up and they would start to populate over this picture. But that brought the kids up to another level because they were looking at each other's words, they were grabbing them, they were riffing on it and making it better. Some were going to the funny place and it was a really great way to get kids doing a writing prompt that I might normally have done inside of just a journal on its own or on a worksheet to be make it more public facing and more exciting that way. Yeah. And I love what you just said there about how they started riffing on and using each other's words. And I think deep within side of, of some of us as teachers, we might see that and think, oh, we don't want them to cheat off of each other. But I don't see that as cheating off of each other. I see that as them seeing something and going, oh, I want to use that. They're like, I want to add that to my mm -hmm, vocabulary, mm -hmm, to my mm -hmm. set of words. And so then they put it into their own. It's it's kind of like transfer to some extent, like what you were talking mm -hmm. about. They get something and then they put it into an in, in using a new and novel way. See, I'm already so, starting to pick stuff up a little bit. Yeah. And so what also happened is my lower kids who don't sit there and like, I don't know what to write about. I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah. They do this and they just use some of these words and all of a sudden they're writing in a way that they didn't even think was possible and their self-esteem is going up. It's just a, it's just a win-win. And then when I tell the kids, that's actually my dog at the end, they love it and it makes it a little bit more engaging and fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, your turn. Yeah, so this is one that... I haven't, I haven't used this a ton yet, but I think that it's got a lot of upside. And so this is synth. And the idea behind synth is it's kind of like a cross between podcasts and discussions. And so what you can do with synth is you make a recording. Well, as a, as a class, you invite students into your podcast, quote unquote, your podcast. And within that podcast, they can make recordings. So imagine that you set up a podcast, so to speak, uh, about a specific topic. And then students are able to record their responses to it. 
And then what they can do is they can go back and listen to each other's stuff and then leave like little audio recordings back to them on it. And so what's neat about this, I think, is that it uses the power of audio to defeat the traditional worksheet. Um, there's a lot going for video right now. And I think that's great. And I think that, um, you know, video is, is really powerful. But one of the powers that audio has that video does not is that you can consume audio without giving it your full 100% undivided attention. And so what that means is students are able to listen to it while watching something else. Um, you know, for me, I know I can do podcasts while I run. I can do them while I'm cutting the grass or something. <laughs> now with this, you've got to interact with the app a little bit more, but it doesn't take your full 100% attention in the same way. So I think getting students interacting in that way could be good. And the audio feature of this doesn't take nearly as much data, nearly as much internet bandwidth as a video would. So again, just another option, another, uh, another thing that you can put in your tool belt. And if I can add to that, and there's some really good comments you, yeah, you might want to bring over, but if I can add to that, someone said you could do that in Flipgrid as well. And you can, and kids can just have their face and they can just do the audio and put like, um, like a, sometimes they just do an emoji. And I also have seen a class, and this was incredible, use Padlet because Padlet has the option of just audio. And they just left audio responses on the Padlet that went together to make a complete story. I was like, what? You've got to have some classroom management to get that kind of thing done. But that was incredible to watch and see. And she said the first time she did it, they just had the, um, the audio responses on the Padlet throughout the, um, like in a grid fashion on the Padlet. And then she got really good and they added. So like we started a story starter, which would be really good for remote learning. Like you start with the first sentence and the kids add the next sentence and do it in audio. Like, yay, that would be so much fun for connection. Yep, yep, absolutely. Good stuff. Okay, um, then I'll go to the next one. Uh, it was hard to watch those comments, but there are some really good comments coming in here. People who know what they're doing. Now, if you've been to any of our other episodes, you've seen this example, but I never know who's been to what. And I just, I this just means so much to me because what we have over here is a worksheet of angles. And then on the other side, we have a seesaw example with kids going outside, finding an angle, an angle in real life. Um, identifying it, and then my whole new saying, press record, um, and recording what it is that angle is. So they're defining it. They're talking about it. And people in the um, upper grades could even say, how does this impact the structure of that uh, piece of furniture or whatever? And so it's, it's the press record and get at thinking. And we don't need to have these one-dimensional worksheets anymore. We can really go to another place. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be remiss to talk about getting away from worksheets if we didn't um, talk about uh, sketch noting. Oops. And this is, comes from my friend, all of our friends, probably all of our friend. Uh, we all know her, Sylvia Duckworth. And um, she talks about uh, the power of sketch noting with kids. A lot of people do. I know we have people in our um, in who watch this who are big sketch noters. And so we want kids to remember things, organize their thoughts and take notes in a creative way because we know that they remember when we put images and text together. It's a brain-based learning theory. And I want you to look at the, I mean, I used to do Cornell notes. I worked at an avid school and it was a big component of it. And I, I have no problem with the idea of kids being organized and taking notes, but I don't understand why they can't be sketch notes. And so we're going to compare these notes to this note from a sixth grade science class about the water cycle. Obviously, this was probably a final part that they turned in, but they could take notes like this instead um, using the idea of sketch notes. And there's still text in this, but Matt, it's missing something important. It needs to be brought into something like Seesaw or Flipgrid or some app where kids Push can press forward. forward. Yep. I'm getting a t-shirt, I'm telling you. Here's an example, probably a final product as well, where kids are, are using um, a version of sketch noting as a final product instead of answering all those questions that you might buy for a novel uh, thing. And this appears to be uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. 
And um, so just another example and a final example from my actual school that I work with, um, we had a day of sketchnoting and Matt's gonna put up the code to the day of sketchnoting. I have a Google Classroom with all of the stuff around that day of sketchnoting, but we brought all the kids in uh, one day through periods because it was a middle school and they all learned to sketch note. We wanted to do something fun, which was have them do a selfie sketch note because Sylvia Duckworth talks about that a bit in, in this um, day of sketch noting um, course. And then what you see is the press record. We didn't just get them to do it. We got them to explain their thinking, why they chose the icons they did, what they thought about the sketch noting. And so that's the important part is we want to get in on that thinking. So don't forget to press record. And final, I found this just a moment ago. Um, I'm really fond of the idea of sketch noting inside of OneNote because you can do it collaboratively. Isn't that like, I want to it's freak cool. out about that. And yeah. I can't even imagine kids being able to do something like that because I haven't, uh, I was all Google all the time and I wasn't thinking in that way. And so this is um, a, a guy and um, in this slide presentation, I have a link to his post on how to do this using OneNote. Yeah. So I think we are at the end. We could look at some of those questions and yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you've got any other questions, um, feel free to drop those in. We had this question about Cami. Cami is a way to annotate on a PDF and it says, does Cami let the students embed audio? And we got another question or another answer down here that says the paid one version. Note does. Okay. And OneNote does that also. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so that's one question that was in there. I know there was another one up here that was asking about the caption this that I shared earlier. And um, the question was, oh. sorry, I'm trying to put it up here. The question was, what do you do that in? I think was basically what the question was. And uh, the answer to that was, um, you could do that in, a, the, my suggestion was to do it in a slide presentation. So just to do a, you know, a simple Google Slides or a PowerPoint and just do it in one single slide, you throw the image on there and then you can put the little uh, speech bubbles on top of it. But there are other things that you could do, you could do that within as well. So those uh, are a couple. Also a shout out for an idea to um, collaboratively sketch note on Jamboard. That could be done. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of times I think people think that Jamboard is an app specifically for the interactive displays, you know, like the interactive monitors that you hang on your wall. But the truth is, is that um, Jamboard is also an app. You know, the app that runs on that big display can be run on practically any device. And so you could certainly do that. And it basically becomes a collaborative whiteboard, right? where you can throw little sticky notes and images and you can annotate and draw on it and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, oh, I'm loving some of these comments. Mm -hmm. um, and we have another one who says uh, one note for pass the sketch note. That's an interesting idea. Pass the sketch note. I'll start with one icon. You bring in another till we have a full like water cycle. That would be really cool. Even you could do that in book creator. I saw someone said that they <laughs> try to avoid Cami because they're not probably into annotating in the way um, that Cami allows for and said, uh, I use um, Jamboard so I don't, mm -hmm. so I can go around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Here's another question. Maybe this is a good place to wrap up. What is OneNote? How would you define it? Holly, do you want to take that one? So this is really hard for me. And I'm going to, I get a little emotional about this because, and Matt has heard this before, but my whole life I've been a Google um, certified innovator. I was one of the first, like, like I've been Google since Google before Google was cool. And, um, and so I never, uh, I was like Microsoft, whatevs, and I didn't really know OneNote. And um, OneNote is this infinite canvas of, it's like a notebook that allows you to do all of these things inside as well as collaborate. So as a, as a teacher, I could have a class notebook that kids 
um, contribute to. And then they can add audio, they can add video, they can add sketch noting, they can do all of this stuff. And then it's collaborative, but they can also have private ones that as a teacher, I can go inside of and look at and it keeps kids organized. And it's really, really uh, got all of these tools and amazing things that you can do inside of it. And for my whole life, I never had kids use it. And I know so many kids who would have had a better experience with organization. And also just like mostly organization um, uh, if I had known about OneNote, but I had my Google hat on and I was like, only Google. And, uh, and I feel like I've let some kids down because I didn't introduce them to OneNote. And OneNote also has um, the ability, and now I'm forgetting because I wanted to look at that comment. <laughs> I got squirreled, <laughs> but um, uh, it also has, oh, I don't know, but, but it's okay. Someone will help yeah. me with the OneNote. Let me that riff on OneNote a little bit too, because um, let's see, I'm trying to pull my pen out here. This is my favorite part about OneNote. I know that students don't always have access to this, but if you've got a pen or a stylus and a touch screen device on it on the web, or if you actually have the OneNote app, the ability to ink, you know, the ability to write on your stuff as well as add text and all of that. It's, it's really, really good stuff. I mean, OneNote has very quickly become my favorite note taking app. This is the one that if I'm doing digital notes, this is the one that I'm using all the time. So really, really so like that. Guess what? We're having a OneNote live tomorrow. I totally oh, forgot yeah. until right now. At that? 1.30. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. having two, Jenna Lee, which is Jenny Long and Salee Clark are coming on along with Mike Tolson uh, to talk about OneNote because I wanna, there's things I must not know because I've been all googly all the time. So I'm, I can't wait to learn more. Yeah, now if you're watching this on the video replay, then all you've got to do is go back and look for the video, which is uh, show what you know with OneNote. Um, that'll be in the Ditch That Textbook YouTube channel, so feel free to take a look there. So real quick to wrap this up, Amy says, so you'd have to use OneNote on a PC. You definitely can. You can, down, you can install the desktop app, but there's some OneNote features, I believe, that you can do on the web too. So the question here, does OneNote work on Chromebooks? I believe there's a web interface that you can use there that doesn't have all of the features, but it still does have a lot of them. So, aha, there and it is. And someone yes. said that the code doesn't work. So I'm putting it in right now into that. Maybe we did something wrong, which would be my fault because Matt asked me to check that. That's okay. <laughs> so um, as Holly's and looking this up, I'm gonna, sorry, what were you going to say, Holly? Oh, it just, if you, um, if your school doesn't allow you to interact with other Google accounts, you'll have to use a personal account to get in. Yeah. Oh, there's a good point. Since we were talking about OneNote, there's also an iPad app for that as well. I so. mean, I know. Uh -huh. I can't wait. Uh -huh. Yeah, there, Holly just dropped the code in. That's the one for the sketch note. Um, that's the Google Classroom code for the day of sketch note, no? Uh, day of sketch noting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, so. All right, so we've gotten lots of um, really good comments in here. This has been fun, and this whole video has been so much better because you all joined us. So if you're joining us live, thank you again so much for doing that. If you haven't subscribed to the Ditch That Textbook YouTube channel, please, please, please do that. YouTube.com slash Ditch That Textbook. You can just hit that little subscribe button, and if there's the little bell next to it, that's going to get you all the notifications whenever we do this again like so tomorrow um, for one note because we don't have the link yet so you'll need to subscribe right exactly so um if you're watching this on the video replay thank you for watching all the way to the end i hope it's been useful to you if you're watching this live we had a blast doing this together with you and sharing all of your ideas as well so um please do join us on another video please do check out the videos and of course um please do check us out at online learning ideas which you can find at onlinelearningideas.com we are sharing all sorts of new ideas uh new ideas every single day as of the recording of this video. So um, do check that out. And let's do this again. What do you think? Yeah, we... tomorrow. 1.30. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. So we will see you on another video. 1.30 Pacific. Pacific. That's right. 4.30 Eastern. Uh, we'll see you on the next video. Thanks.